Well, it's really an honor now uh, to have someone who's really, really been a pioneer uh, in understanding uh, the pathophysiology of ischemia in general, uh, but in women in particular, uh, Dr. Noel Barry Mayers, um, the world's expert in this area, is now going to talk about sex specific considerations mm -hmm. in the pathophysiology of uh, myocardial infarction. I did actually stick with the original title, which is sex specific considerations, but what I'm going to talk about is this is becoming relevant to men. Um, and I actually welcome that because I think uh, when we get the men in the room, things can change. Uh, I get to go forward, right? There, are, These are my disclosures. They're essentially all grant support except for one board directorship. Or, of or a, maybe when we get the men out of the room, things could change. <laughs> no, that, no? That's not, that we've tried that. You tried that? <laughs> we've tried that. It doesn't work. All right, well, um, what I am going to talk about, and we had a nice preamble from Dr. Spots, sex-specific considerations. We're going to talk about myonuca, um ischemia with no obstructive coronary disease, so as per Dr. Galati, sort of the preamble before the heart attack, um, and then spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Um, and we do have data about some of these. Um, what we're seeing, and just to reiterate uh, what Dr. Spots told us, is that um, although overall acute myocardial infarction mortality has been dropping, there's just a very stunning gap. And if we were, if you know, to, to paraphrase Dr. Ichipori, I mean, we have to eliminate these disparities. And this is a very embarrassing and persistent disparity demonstrated uh, where you can see the mortality between the blue and the, and the red lines. Um, it's, it's just unacceptable that women are more likely to die of the heart attack. And most of these data are adjusted. So, um, you know, the hecklers in the audience that say, well, it's because the women are older, or well, it's because they're more often diabetic. It's like, no, we, we know how to adjust for that. Um, there is also, as we said, an increase in myocardial infarction in young women, um, similar to what we just saw moments ago. Uh, it's going up, and <clears throat> one of the things that I would like to address in the panel discussion and get input, I think we're gonna see a tsunami of CVD related to COVID. And um, deferred care, uh, weight gain, lack of physical activity. And um, we need to, you know, uh, the US military always says we need to get out in front of a problem. W we need to be thinking about this, uh, especially for our younger women. We know that women are less likely to receive the guideline recommended care. And we know that the care works. Um, here's, here's data, you know, again, to any heckler, well, you know, it wasn't really tested in women. No, nope, the AMI uh, guidelines, they were, uh, because there's so many heart attacks, the sample sizes are really big, and the randomized controlled trial of what we call optimal medical therapy always included a sufficient number of women that you would be able to um, uh, say that, yeah, it works equally well in women. So biology and bias, you know, do we have the will to improve CVD outcomes in women with evidence-based guidelines therapy? This is an editorial that Dr. Janet Way and I wrote um, along with Dr. Tim Henry using the Minneapolis Heart Institute, and Cleveland Clinic has demonstrated this as well. When you have a clear and bulleted protocol and everyone is trained to take care of that STEMI or the end STEMI, and we're gonna do it the Minneapolis Heart way, or we're gonna do it the Cleveland Clinic way, look at those lines. The mortality between women and men is the same. And this is one of the, it's not a paradox, but it's a puzzle, um, and I've actually discussed this with Pam Douglas pretty regularly. There's a difference between observational data that very consistently demonstrate these gaps, and then when you actually look at things like randomized controlled trials or integrated health systems where they, you know, it's a quality indicator. Uh, door to balloon is a quality indicator. Uh, making sure that no one is left behind, everybody gets optimal medical therapy, that's a quality indicator. So when health systems, health institutions, uh, uh, say that they're going to do this, they're doing it for quality reasons, but it actually eliminates disparities, and we can do it. Do we have the will to do this? And the ACC, I think, does. 
Um, this is an extension of what we wrote in the interest of time. I can't share with you every one of these bullets, um, but this editorial basically outlined what we could do to eliminate these disparities based on the Cleveland Clinic and the Minneapolis Heart Experience. And again, they weren't trying to save women's lives. They were just trying to have universal, high quality care. And oh, by the way, so see, it's another why you need the men in the room. Because <clears throat> everybody's got to participate, right? Women's heart disease is not a female problem, it's everybody's problem. All right, well, this is an older slide, but I still like to use it <clears throat> because it's an example of a health system that integrated uh, early the ACC um, guidelines uh, about um, uh, utilizing optimal medical therapy uh, in uh, acute coronary syndrome. <clears throat> it's not very well, uh, it's not a great graph, so I color-coded it for you. So they had before and after. It's not a randomized controlled trial, but it just demonstrates the power of observational data. So following guideline implementation, mortality for women shown in the red arrow uh, improved significantly. Now, male mortality did not change. It's those top two lines. And why is that? Because the guys were all getting optimal medical therapy, and we're now going to go into endotypes because doctors don't prescribe. When they have diagnostic uncertainty, they then have therapeutic uncertainty. And so these endotypes are now going to play a role because the doc, they don't hate women. They don't know what the problem is. It's a minoca. I don't know. Should we treat? Should we not treat? Yeah. Um, following, the, again, the guideline implementation, the blue line suggests that if we really wanted women and men to have parity, similar to the Cleveland Clinic and Minneapolis Heart, we do have more work to do. Yeah. So let's talk then a little bit about this. This was early on in our women's ischemia syndrome evaluation, which was a contract commissioned by National Heart, Lung, and Blood to study cardiac syndrome X. And that was 30 years ago. Uh, and that's because um, National Heart, Lung, and Blood um, had an interest in women's heart. It was following the recognition in the 1980s of this epidemic of heart disease in women that clearly nobody understood anything about it. And um, so we started out by trying to study cardiac syndrome X, which we did. <coughs> but this was a systematic review uh, that uh, Raffaele Brigiardini, uh, an Italian colleague and I who had access to a lot of these data sets through DCRI, uh, and we just uh, mapped out, and these are all angiographic core labs. So it's acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, MI without ST segment elevation, our fond and the STEMIs, and then STEMIs all the way down at the bottom. And women, it, you know, had twice to sometimes three times the number of normal coronary arteries as indicated by these angiographic core labs. And if you were to go to an interventional cardiologist in the early 2000s and say, well, how often do you see normal coronaries in the setting of leaked enzymes, you know, positive ECG and symptoms, they'd say, it's not common. Well, <laughs> it's not common in men, right? <laughs> so um, here's a slide. I think I got this from Martha. Um, uh, underlying ischemic etiologies continue contributing to MINOCA, and this is increasingly a term. Another thing I want to talk about at the panel is, is do we really need to have a new ICD-10 code? Uh, but it, it outlines the different um, opportunities for pathophysiologic uh, abnormalities to contribute to uh, a heart attack. Uh, and again, a lot of this work was uh, uh, done by Harmony Reynolds. Um, uh, we have our SCAD investigators, we have the Jackie Saw, we have the Mayo Clinic uh, trying to figure out SCAD. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the microvasculature, um, and I will uh, share with you what we've found as well as others. Here's my comment. It's not all about women anymore. So here's our VA cart, um, and this is a nice summary of almost 40,000 predominantly male patients of the age criteria, even though one out of five soldiers is a, f a woman now. They typically aren't quite at the age where they're going to have a lot of CBD, and this was a retrospective review. But what it demonstrates is that uh, INOCA, meaning signs and symptoms of ischemia that triggers a clinically indicated coronary angiogram, and for any of you that have ever worked at a VA, they don't stay late. 
So they're not doing inappropriate cats um, sort of at the end of the day for additional RVUs, right? Yeah. So one out of two uh, angiograms done uh, in the VAs now has open arteries. So, and I can tell you my sh thoughts about the pathophysiology because this is new and there's data that it's, it's getting worse, meaning there's less and less obstructive coronary disease. <clears throat> Mechanisms of myocardial ischemia, we've mapped this out fairly well. Wise and other investigators, um, all the way on the left, that's what we know and love. That's how we really know what to treat um, with revascularization as well as optimal medical therapy. Right in the middle is vasospastic epicardial coronary disease, well known, loved, probably less than 5% of ischemia um, because it's just not that common. Uh, uh, Prince Metal's angina would be the textbook uh, term for that. And so what we've been studying, as well as others, is the microvascular dysfunction because you can't really readily see it with a simple coronary angiogram. Uh, we called it the dark side of the moon. Um, but you know that coronary vascular resistance in your physiology course, uh, epicardial coronaries, which we study and, and examine very carefully, contribute less than 10% of the resistance. And of course, resistance is what determines the flow, right? Uh, hemodynamic significance doesn't happen until you get over 70% in general, <clears throat> and coronary microvasculature is responsible for that 70% of the resistance, so it's pretty important. Uh, we've demonstrated uh, that there are sort of two functional problems. One is the microvasculature fails to dilate. The other one is that it inappropriately constricts. The failure to dilate the adenosine pathway, very easily measured with a CFR, or otherwise known as an FFR, but there's no stenosis, and the adenosine is easy mixed by the nurse in the cath lab. That portends high risk of MACE as well as death. The constriction, not so much, but it causes a lot of chest pain and a lot of probably unnecessary ED visits. We've also demonstrated, <clears throat> in particular, the failure to dilate as well as the microvascular constriction is associated with increased levels of ultra high sensitivity TNI. So, and it doesn't even have to be in the acute setting. The patients that we studied in this cohort were stable walking around. So um, this is causing damage, um, acute as well as chronic. Uh, we have an ongoing investigation now, and this is a complicated slide, um, but Dr. Janet Way and Dr. Mike Nelson in my group are working on this. This chronic low-grade ischemia with troponin leaks potentially is leading to HFPAF, and these are the mechanistic pathways. And if you wanted to say sex-specific or at least sex-preferred, HFPEF is the other thing that we don't understand, and we finally have some drugs, but we don't even know how they work. We just know they work, so it's an exciting time. <clears throat> Existing scores um, do not work in MINOCA or INOCA. This is work done by one of our Israeli fellows, uh, now uh, Dr. Herzegovina, back in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, primary Primary prevention scores underestimate risk. Secondary prevention scores um, overestimate risk. So we, we need new scores. Uh, and that's a, a, a job that we could do, and we've got guideline writers here. Um, we could be working on this. Um, this is therapeutic uncertainty in equipoise, as I said before. Here's what happens um, when you look observationally. Um, patients have evidence of ischemia, but they don't get treated for angina or hypertension. Um, they don't get treated, sorry, for the statins either, as we saw in Dr. Spatz's cot. This is just an example of something that takes about 12 minutes. Um, uh, this is a patient with a mid-LAD bridge. It is not functional in the classical sense, but it certainly serves um, as a nidus for atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, and then when you do your coronary flow reserve with the adenosine, uh, it, you actually can see vasoconstriction in this one. This is an, an unusual case, but the coronary flow reserve of being 1.8 is very low. When you give them nitroglycerin, you have resolution of the vasoconstriction. And also the other reason they're having angina is their LVEDP is 18. They're on their way to HFPAF. We also do a lot of work with uh, cardiac MRI. This is uh, data from Dr. Janet Way's CIRC article. Uh, demonstrating that 10% of our INOCA patients have evidence of a prior ischemic infarct, not myocarditis, 10%, and the majority of them were never diagnosed as having an MI. 
They just had a lot of pain. We are working now, of course, um, on a big trial. We use these pharmacologic probe trials, and our thoughts were initially off the shelf. Let's look at things that work for ischemic heart disease when you have obstructive coronary disease. And you can see um, ACE inhibitors worked, hormones didn't work, aplenarone was no additional benefit, uh, sildenafil, nope, and uh, renalazine worked in a very selective group with a low coronary flow reserve. Um, but this was uh, the pavement to uh, be able to gain uh, funding for a large randomized major adverse outcomes trial. So we are randomizing 4,422 women with angina, no obstructive CAD, and they're randomized to intensive statin, uh, 40 or 80 of Atorva, 40 of Rosuva, as well as maximally tolerated ACE or ARB. Uh, versus just regular primary care. It's open label, it's a strategy point of care trial, and um, of our 4,000 we've recruited during a pandemic, uh, a little over 2,000. So uh, we are hanging in there. We are going to do it. <laughs> this is our randomization schemata, and uh, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do, and this is coming directly from the Lancet Commission. Uh, we need to understand INOCA much better, all the way from epidemiology to treatment. MINOCA is going to be about 10% of that larger group. Uh, SCAD I didn't really address today. It's um, much less common, but certainly uh, critically important for our young women of uh, reproductive age, especially the ones that are pregnant. Uh, and then STEMI, you know, it, it might be as easy as just trying to really enforce guidelines. Okay, my time is up. I think that's it. Thank you.